There's sunshine, it's going to be 50 degrees by next week. Valentine's Day is at the end of the week. It's going to be our only really cold day of the week. That's what I'm understanding right now. So things aren't so bad, guys. Now, today we're going to be finishing Chapter 3. Just a reminder, on Valentine's Day, VD, as they would say, I can't believe I said that on a microphone, uh, the economic systems exercise and your video discussions are due. Both easy, easy 10 points, especially the video discussion. Now, here's the deal. Next week, we're going to be doing our first exam in this class. But you're going to have a choice. You're going to get the option of either doing that exam on Monday or Wednesday. So we're going to vote on that momentarily. Now, guys, what we're going to be doing next in this class, next Friday, as it turns out, I'm, I'm hopefully going to have career services here to go over a couple other networking tools we have available to you guys. And it may actually eliminate an assignment so that they can come in and take up some more of your time with good stuff, i.e. things that are going to help you get a job, things. So we had something listed in the syllabus called the top 10 exercise. I'm likely going to eliminate that exercise in exchange for you guys doing some work with career services. What I would like you to do now, however, is to give me your opinion. It makes no difference to me because I give the test no matter what. Guys, would you rather take the test on Monday or Wednesday? Keep in mind, I'm going to be giving you a review sheet after today for chapters 1 through 3. You want something to study for. I'm asking you to go to this web address using your laptop or your phone. It's pulpedcom forward slash Kent, K-E-N-T, Tonkin, T-O-N-K-I-N, Kent Tonkin 063. And let me know when you would rather take the test. Because uh, it makes no difference to me. We'll give a second for everybody to vote. And we do this anonymous so we uh, don't get anybody uh, getting, uh, getting bullied if they pick the wrong day. But again, it makes no difference to me. Now keep in mind. If we do the test next Wednesday, we'll also be starting a new chapter on Friday this week, and we'll be continuing that on Monday. So we'll be covering material that won't be on the test. After today, I'll be sending you a review. Give it a minute to make sure everybody has a chance to, to get their, their opinion heard. But it looks like by a landslide, we're going to be doing the first exam in this class next Wednesday. Okay? Any questions, guys? Guys, what format are my exams? <coughs> Anybody remember? <laughs> Multiple choice, true or false. You guys, what I'm going to be asking you to do now, if you would, pull your computers out, because I sent you guys a link this morning for something called Lockdown Browser. I sent it to you in your email. I'm going to ask you to take a minute right now <laughs> and open that up and install Lockdown Browser. So please, go ahead and even if you already have it on your computer, let's make sure you have the most up-to-date version. So go to your email. There's a link for Lockdown Browser. I'm asking you to install it now. And I have a zero credit exercise, so you can attempt to use it. Please get your computer out. Where is it? I'll take the video on. I'll crack the screen. All right, we'll just make sure you install it, okay? Guys, if you have it back here, go ahead and open up and install it. We're going to take a minute out of class to do that. There is a mock exam on chapter three, just to make sure you know how to use a lockdown browser. So the, if you install it, go ahead and try the mock exam. It's no credit involved, it just shows that it works. Keep in mind, we show up next Wednesday, guys. You gotta have a functioning laptop. If you have a, an issue where you have a broken laptop or whatever, get a loaner, don't show up without a laptop <coughs> next Wednesday. Everybody able to download that okay? Give it a second, once everybody's in, we'll get started with the material for today. Anybody not able to find that download link? Just make sure it's working out for everybody. All right, everybody's got the download going. Excellent. Guys, we'll give it a minute. Guys, please put your phones away. In fact, for the remainder of this class, and for every class from now on, guys, please don't have your phones out for use in this class unless we're using them for class. You can have them on your desk, that's fine. Don't, don't have them in your hands using them, please. Let's be here together. Guys, is anybody experiencing any trouble with the download? 
If not, what I'm going to permit you to do is continue to work on that while we get into the material for today. If you've already got it installed, great. If you're having issues with installation, come and see me. Guys, we left off talking about trade protectionism last class. When I say trade protectionism, what's another term for trade protectionism? Something that's a T word we're using these days, the Trump administration, which is also a T word. It's tariffs, man. Lewis, will you explain your own word? What's a tariff? Uh, tax on things going in or out of the country. You got it. Why do we do it? Uh, to keep business in the country. Exactly right. We want to make our own goods uh, more uh, competitive with other people's products. For example, we make something in China, it takes a lot less to do uh, to be able to make it export. Do you guys remember <coughs> what is the required minimum wage for auto workers in Mexico under the new trade agreement? Do you remember what it was? But $16 an hour. What does the average worker in Detroit make for making a car in the United States? About 45 bucks. It's a lot more expensive to make cars here in the United States. We have two kinds of tariffs primarily. Those are protective tariffs. We're trying to protect our own goods and services. And then we have revenue tariffs. That just means we're trying to make money because we can't. Has anybody traveling internationally ever gone through customs? What do you have to do in customs, Dylan? And why does the government want to know that? Because there's no way to police customs and they have a good or bad customs or whatever. If I'm going to Jamaica, they want to see how much rum I'm bringing back, or maybe if I'm bringing something else back that maybe I shouldn't be bringing with me. So we're, we're making sure we're not bringing things into the economy. By the way, here's a little trivia question for you. Did anybody see why the Girl Scouts were in the news in Chicago yesterday? Anybody see this in the news? What, what, what time of year is it for the Girl Scouts? You gotta admit that's pretty good marketing. Okay, you get, go to some place where people are getting a product that's going to make them hungry, and the Girl Scouts are setting up cookie stands. Let's hear it for free enterprise. The Girl Scouts and their uniforms are even green. This is crazy. So, guys, in terms of uh, protective tariffs, though, revenue tariffs, protective tariffs to protect business, revenue, make money on products coming into the country because we can. We sometimes have what we refer to as quotas, and that means, hey, uh, Japan, we're only going to import. 10,000 trucks from you, from Toyota, after that you're going to have to pay a large tax. You <coughs> have a complete trade embargo on a country. Can somebody tell me one country which the United States has a complete trade embargo against right now? We're not doing any business with them. Yes, sir. China. I'm sorry? China. I still didn't hear you. China. China, no, we, we are, we're doing some trade with them. We're putting tons of tariffs on it. It's a good guess, though. Who? We're not doing any business with North Korea, and one other country that's very had a very long history of an embargo with us would be Cuba, and we've had an embargo with them since the 60s. We also do do any business with Iran right now either. So we use this as a weapon of, of uh, trade, I would say a, a weapon of trade to be able to settle political disagreements. Guys, I'm, like, I'm here to tell you today about some ways in which companies have gotten creative to get around tariffs. Back in the 70s, there was something called the chicken tax. And the chicken tax, which was on poultry, ended up affecting the way we sell cars in the United States. This is a Subaru Brat. It's a pickup truck. It came from Japan. Have you guys notice anything unique about this pickup truck? What do you notice? It's the size. The urgency there. It's tiny. It's a tiny little truck for sure. You guys notice anything else? Josh, what's in the bed? Yeah, pretty crazy, right? Those were not aftermarket. Those were installed. Here's why there are seats in the bed of the Subaru Brat. Back in the 1970s, the United States was exporting really low-cost chicken everywhere in the world. We had an excess of chicken for some reason. And we're flooding markets around the world. Well, the Europeans came back on us and said, we're putting a tariff on your chicken. In Asia, they put a tariff on our chicken. They said, you guys are going to not kill our local industry. And we said, we'll show you guys. We're going to put a tariff on your pickup trucks. We're not going to import Datsuns, back then what Nissans were called, Toyotas, Suzukis, anything. Well, Subaru bolted a couple of seats into the bed of their pickup and said, this is not a pickup truck. It's a passenger car. And that's how they got around the trade sticking beds and sticking seats in the bed of a pickup truck. This is what people will do to get around tariffs. Crazy. 
Here's the reason why you don't see any of these on the road anymore, by the way. The steel in these vehicles is so poor quality, it just r literally rusted off the bodies. You hardly see any of them still around. How many of you think that's a good idea to put backward-facing seats in the bed of a pickup truck? What's the problem with this arrangement? What do you think, Lewis? What's the problem with this arrangement? I'm sorry. Yeah, one rollover, man. It's not, it's not going to work out well for anybody in the bed of that truck. This often, by the way, shows up on, uh, on exams as a bonus question. I'd remember the name of that car if I were you. Subaru Brat. So, guys, in terms of imports, imports affect a lot of us in terms of jobs, in terms of labor, in terms of factories. Guys, but the other part of it is imports can be good for us, too. For example, if a Subaru is made in Japan, they make them in, in a, uh, I guess, Fujikawa in Japan, a lot of Subarus come from, because they're a product of Fuji Heavy Industries. Uh, my Mazda was made in Hiroshima. It's not good necessarily for people who make cars, but who are those kind of imports good for? Are there people who benefit from imports? Yes. Well, for me, for sure, I love Mazdas. I'm very happy about it. I benefit as a consumer. So, who else, Tyler, who else benefits from this? We're importing Mazdas from Japan in the United States. Who might benefit? How about somebody who sells Mazdas? A Mazda dealership makes money. The secondary used car market makes money. It's not a linear equation. Here's the other thing, too. If we have parts that go into, into components, into vehicles, a lot of components from our vehicles come from other places. If you buy a Ford, it's got part of Japan, China, and probably somewhere in Indonesia in the vehicle as well. So we do need to import things as well. So import products do not mean um, automatically a destruction of jobs. <laughs> we have a few folks in, in the world who are trying to help us maintain global trade. The biggest one is called the World Trade Organization, WTO. Those are the folks who work with something called the World Bank to make sure that we are conducting commerce in ways that are fair and equitable. If we got a problem, for example, with China, if we got a problem with Japan, if we got a problem with India in terms of how we're doing trade, we should be taking our disputes to the World Trade Organization. They don't want tariffs, man. They want free trade. They want us to work it out. But occasionally we get to impasses where even the World Trade Organization itself can't help us, which is why we have so many tariffs going on right now. We also have things called common markets, guys. A common market means basically you have a series of countries who all are agreeing on using a same uh, kind of, of uh, currency that are lowering barriers to trade that are saying we're going to have free trade between our countries. The most common example is the Eurozone. So if we get into the European Union, you can go anywhere in the European Union and pay with the Euro. It's wonderful. We have a common currency. There are downsides to it as well, however, because you're also giving up some of your power. If you're part of a, uh, of a trade zone, like the Eurozone, for example, if you're part of a common market, it also means you're giving up part of your authority to other people, which is why there have been some opposition to it. For example, the, uh, the members of the Euro European Union are, are clearly illustrated in our book, but we recently had a country that just left the European Union. Guys, why did Great Britain, why did the UK decide to leave the European Union? This just happened, guys. Right? Happened on the 31st of January. <coughs> Why did they leave? Any thoughts? <coughs> yes? They didn't feel they were trapped anymore. Yeah, they felt they were paying into to a system and providing financial support to a system that wasn't benefiting them. Well, here's the, the thing that's interesting about it. Uh, next to Germany, uh, the UK was the biggest economy in Europe. So this is a substantial blow to the EU for sure. Are there other reasons? why the UK pulled out. We know they were paying in and feeling they, like they weren't getting anything out of it. Are there other reasons? <coughs> Any other thoughts? I'm sorry. They wanted to feel more independent. They wanted to feel more independent. They wanted set their own rules. There are some people that argue that the political change that's been happening in the United States has also been influential in other parts of the world. For example, in the United States, when I say this, this is not an endorsement, this is not a slam, this is not me giving my personal political opinion. But there are folks who believe, for example, because uh, our president, President Trump, is such a non-traditional choice for president, it's actually spurred on something called populism. 
which means more thoughts around blue collar workers, more thoughts around the common person's opinions, and more activism by common people in politics, maybe than before, where politics was considered to be a little bit more intellectual. So the common working people in the UK were some of the folks pushing the hardest for this because they felt that the barriers to trade coming down had hurt their own economy. Time will tell. One of the biggest things that I think that the UK is going to face now, however, because they're no longer part of the EU, this small island country now has to negotiate separate trade agreements with all of these countries. Is that going to speed up or slow down trade for them? I think it's going to slow it down, too. I think what they did here was a very short-sighted decision that was, uh, was motivated by maybe more political intentions than commerce intentions. I have been wrong before, and I'll be wrong again, I'm sure. But I'll be interested to see five years from now when people are looking back if they believe this was a good or a bad decision. Guys, if you have nothing on your desk in front of you, please put something in front of you to write down notes on so you can be prepared for our exam that's coming on next week. Or if you're taking notes on your laptop, that's fine. Guys, we actually just ended something called the North American Free Trade Agreement. Well, I shouldn't say we ended it. We just upgraded it. The North American Free Trade Agreement is not a common market. But it is the idea of tariff-free trade, or mostly tariff-free trade, between Mexico, the United States, and Canada, because we're our, th we're our own biggest trading partners other than China. When we think about it, guys, the reason we have strawberries in January is because we have a great relationship with Mexico. The reason Mexico has such great access to wheat and grains is because of the relationship with the United States. The reason we get so much delicious maple syrup is because we have a great relationship with our neighbor for, to the north. So that's the North American Free Trade Agreement. There are a lot of people, for example, who were not excited about this free trade agreement. Now keep in mind, this was back in the 90s. This was back during the Bill Clinton era in the United States. So we said to basically our American people, we're going to take down the barriers to importing and exporting goods from the United States to Canada and Mexico and vice versa. Who would be excited about this arrangement? Yes. Canadian companies would like to come to the United States. Absolutely. Canadian companies would be very excited about it. Within the United States. Who is excited, John, about this agreement? You would think the companies would anyway. Is there anybody who was not excited about this agreement? Yeah, anybody basically I'm gonna prime you guys a little bit on this. We, we said before, where are the wages higher, Mexico or the United States? United States. United States. So if you want to know why Chevy Suburbans are being made in Mexico, it's because of NAFTA. Because G General Motors said, basically, it's cheaper for me to set up a factory in a place where I can pay somebody five bucks an hour. It's cheaper for me to have a factory where I don't have to comply with safety regulations and take care of people. And I can make cars in, in conditions that American workers wouldn't stand for. And so labor unions opposed it. A lot of working people opposed it. A lot of companies were all for it. It's funny to me because when we associate free trade with a party, we typically associate it with the political party of the Republicans. We typically associate tariffs with Democrats. In this current state of reality, however, our current president, who is running, who is running the Republican, actually supports some level of trade protectionism. So the world does not make linear sense in the way it did back in the 1990s. It's not right or wrong. It's just a change in the way that we look at these things. So what NAFTA's big goals were, guys, were basically to make things more fair and open so that we could sell goods in between our countries. Part of the fallout was, however, that more of our industry left the United States. I'll give you a great example. Levi's, who was at one point the number one manufacturer of blue jeans in the, in the world, operated out of San Francisco, and almost all of their factories went to Mexico during this period of time. In fact, now they're in places like China and, and uh, all over Asia as well. So that was part of that era. We also had something called the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement, and this was essentially going to be the Asian version of NAFTA. Uh, Obama was pushing for it. Trump finally decided to kill it off. People who were excited about this said, we can sell more goods and services in Asia. We can avoid the kinds of things we're dealing with now, like tariffs. Opponents basically thought it would speed up the loss of jobs to places like China. Uh, ultimately, it was killed. It did not happen. Here's the bad part of it. We had an opportunity in the United States to be a leader, to be the folks who were really making this happen. And instead, uh, now China has taken the lead in these kinds of negotiations. 
in the long run, we'll see how it works out. So, guys, if you were building a business, if you were trying to think of an open population where you could sell goods and services, where would you be looking in the world? Where would you be? Yes. Asia. Yeah, I would too. Tell me why. Moving <laughs> population like China and India both have over a billion people. That's that's a lot of people to sell to. You better believe it. And in their their developed countries, I think we can we whether or not we agree with their political system, <coughs> China is not a developing country for the most part in the major areas, and it's got a large rural section. No two ways about it. It is a technological powerhouse. It is a it is a developed country. Where else would you guys want to sell? Where else would you be looking? What are your thoughts? Where else do you think we can sell lots of goods and services? There is. Where, where can we? Where do you think we can have a growing and booming market? What part of the world? What part of the world would you go to? Africa. Tell me why. I agree with your decision too. Because they're growing right now. There's a lot of tourism and a lot of uh, research. I completely agree. One of the biggest problems the African continent has faced is civil wars. It's faced conflict. If they can figure the politics and the tribalism out, that's going to be a powerful continent because they've got so much in terms of resources. They've got so much in terms of population. They could be an intellectual and an industrial powerhouse if they have the right leadership in those areas. I completely agree. Brazil is a big economy now. Brazil has come to be a world player. And India, what's India so famous for? What do we get so much from from India? It's a key word as well. What might it be? Tech support and technology. A lot of the coding that goes into making our devices work comes from India. They are very technology centric. Obviously, we know that China is getting bigger all the time. And they're one of our biggest sources of outsourcing. Guys, I always ask you these kind of perception questions. You have two options here. If you say it's positive or negative. If I say the term outsourcing, how many of you think it's positive by, by a show of hands? If I say the term outsourcing, how many of you see it as negative by a show of hands? It's an emotional reaction. What does the, Josh, when we hear the term outsourcing, what, what's the very first thing we think? Well, if, if I say, hey, you're getting outsourced, what does it mean? It means you're losing your job. Outsourcing, oh, I'm sorry. Outsourcing means you're losing your job. Outsourcing means somebody else is doing this. Please turn that off. We are going to be doing outsourcing of factories. We're going to be doing outsourcing of jobs all over the country. That means work is going somewhere else. It also means, however, we're outsourcing functions to companies, however, who can do work that we can't do. So we outsource all the time. We outsource things like payroll and HR. We outsource things like accounting, we outsource things we can't do. Outsourcing simply means somebody else is doing the job for us. What are the pros of it? Well, the pros are if you're outsourcing a function that's not core to your, your work function, you can, you can concentrate on the things that are. If I have a small company that does woodworking, what do I need to be doing accounting for? Somebody else can do that for me. A con is if I outsource, I could lose employment. I could lose jobs. Here within St. Francis, we outsource several functions. People work here, but they don't work for us. Who am I talking about? I'm sorry? UPMC, for sure, for healthcare. What's another one? Yes. Parkhurst Dining, owner of Eaton Park. Is there one more that, is, that you guys know about? A very large corporation that's got a presence in JFK. Yeah, Under Armour is not so much outsourcing. We have an exclusive with them, though. But where do you buy your Under Armour? If, you, if you're not now, the bookstore is run by Barnes and Noble. That's all outsourcing, guys. So we can take things that, that do not benefit our core function, and we can outsource them so we can concentrate on our core function. Guys, in terms of, uh, of being ready for the global economy, what are the two fastest growing languages globally beside English? We have Spanish, and what, is there another one? French. <laughs> Not French, it's a good guess though. Mandarin Chinese. So we've got the, the growth of the Asian country, we've got the, the growth of, of the Hispanic population. If you are able to be bilingual, there's a, a, a lot of value for you in business to be able to do work internationally. Guys, before we get into our next section, because we're going to be showing a brief video here for you, I would like to see if anybody has a question or comment before we jump into our next type of outsourcing. Yes, sir. So the European Union members have 
have open borders with Mexico, right? So Southern Ireland is still an independent country and it's part of the EU. Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom as well. So do they not have open place of Ireland and not have open access now that they belong to the South? Oh, there's actually been some discussion going on that because the answer is they don't really know. There's actually been some discussion because Northern Ireland obviously is a subject of the British Crown, the, the country is. There's talk of putting in an actual border, like a physical border between those two countries now. And if, if you remember, what, what was the big thing that separated those two countries in the first place? You got it. It was the, the North, Northern Ireland Civil War, well, the Irish Civil War. Northern Ireland was a stronghold of Catholicism. The rest of Ireland was, was basically a part of the British monarchy, so they were Anglican. And people, thousands of people died in that conflict. And those wounds were still fresh. You start putting up a wall between these two countries, well, that's going to reignite a lot of those fires. Like, I uh, I pray that the, the British government figures this out in a way that makes sense, because right now, technically, the rest of Ireland is still shut off. I think they, they came as part of the deal to leave the EU, because even though they're their own country, they still are compliant with a lot of British laws. I know so, that they uh, voted for it, so that Scotland voted very strongly for it. To stay. The European Union, but the, the, the British part of the Yep, it, it, there's a lot of division there. We're, we're going to have some problems coming up with that situation. Yes? Well, I mean, we're getting into the idea of colonialism. You know, the idea that countries take over other countries, and sometimes they let them go, and sometimes <laughs> they don't. In terms of why the Brits were so high on leaving uh, the EU, when I say what I'm about to say, keep in mind, this is my opinion. So take it as such. Do not take this as gospel. When things are not good economically, people look for people to blame. Uh, if we look, for example, at the countries that have faced revolutions, one of the, one of the biggest ones would be uh, Iran in 1979. <laughs> Iran used to be a, uh, a developed country that was very open-minded, very academic, a lot of liberty, a lot of freedom, a very quote-unquote secular country. Well, there was a very big part of the population who lived in poverty and felt very disenfranchised. And when political radicals started saying to those folks, this is all the government's fault that you're in this position, we can offer you a path to freedom, that's when the 1979 revolution happened, that's when fundamentalism took over, and after they took over through the government, the next thing they did was to ransack the universities, get rid of the free thinkers and the academics. So all that stuff went away with them. People in England did not feel that they were sharing in the economic prosperity and the boom the countries like Germany were experiencing. And so they were basically saying to their politicians, we're getting screwed in this deal. We want out. That's really where a lot of the roots of it came from. Somebody from the UK may completely disagree with me and say that we want national sovereignty. We don't want to be ruled. But the, the flip side is the, the, the UK was never completely in the EU either. They never went with the common currency. <coughs> they still kept the English pound. They never did so they'd accept euros, but they never gave up their own currency. So they were kind of like putting one foot in the pool to begin with. So in terms of why they were so hip on leaving, I think part of it is people blaming uh, somebody else for the problems. I think part of it is a, is a matter of, of national pride. Did I answer your questions, guys? And as far as the Ireland issue, that's going to be messy. I, I, I feel for those folks. I think it's going to be something they're going to have to figure out. Excellent questions, guys. Other questions? All right, guys. I would like you to sit back and relax for a minute because we're going to watch a little video about the one of the most recent forms of exporting, or I should say outsourcing, and it's called medical tourism. Lots of reactions. I know it's health sciences. It's pretty crazy how much we're paying for healthcare in this country. Does anybody remember, out of every 10 bucks spent in this country, how many are going into the healthcare system? Two out of every 10 bucks. We're, we spend more than any other country in the world on healthcare, and our results are, are dead in the middle. Yes? Who are risky though? Well, tell me more. What are some of the you, you're, you're nailing it. What are some of the risks to doing this? Like, you'll know that if, 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 like, people you go to extraction mills, you really, 
that's one thing. Can you define the internet for like four months after the event? So is it true? Is it, is it something you can trust? Other reactions to this? Yes. I guess they wouldn't want to get like a hard bypass in like a country like Vietnam or some like I just I don't know. There's a lot of inherent risk with that when you like speak the language and you don't understand the community and you don't have like a drone and you still want to like essentially blow the campus apart. Yeah, I mean you're taking a risk in two ways of that. Other reactions. It's pretty interesting. There was a healthcare system in southern the United States. This was a, a company or a, a state-run system. I think it was in Atlanta or Georgia, one of those uh, places. And essentially, people who were working for the state government, they were offering them incentives. They were offering to pay them to go and get their procedures out of country because they were saving so much on their health insurance. They were actually paying for them. Pretty interesting to see how this stuff is shifting around. I would like to know, though, however, because we, I am going to ask you to bring up your laptop or your phone for a minute. And I, I would like you to tell me, would you go outside of your home country for, for major surgery? Yes or no? I'd love to know. And again, go to polltv.com forward slash Kent Tonkin 063. And tell me, so we have, we have a few votes for both so far. I, I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say about this. Your home country. Yeah. Some, some of us, for example, come from countries with really good prices on their health care. So, would you, but can I put you on the spot? Just because I know, I know that uh, Canada has a, a, a social medicine system. You hear us in the States talk all the time about the cost of health care. What do you think about your, your own systems in Canada? No, we're, we're, we're talking about Canada here. Crazy. Any other reactions from those of you coming from places with free healthcare? Free, free, not necessarily free. Reactions? Anything is now because uh, usually the country of the healthcare system is different by the north and the south. So a lot of people from the south are in love with Italy, probably in other countries or in the healthcare system. So there's a, there's a variety of quality based yeah. on where you're, which is better, the north or the south? Okay, good thing to remember if I'm traveling to Italy for a heart surgery and going to the north. Then. Guys, for, for those of you who an answered heck yes, for somebody tell me why you would. For somebody who answered that they would go out of the country for health care, tell me why they would. I'm dying to hear from somebody. Oh, please. Seriously, free. Did you, did you answer yes? Tell me why. So it could come down to a matter of cost. If your insurance company's not going to pay for it, you got to pay for it out of pocket. And sometimes people, for example, who have exhausted all other options, for example, if you had the misfortune of knowing somebody in your family or extended uh, group of friends who's had cancer, sometimes we run out of options here in the States. People may want to try that. Is there somebody who said, hell no, who would defend their choice? Whether or not go outside the country. Yes. My biggest concern would be follow-up. If you, if you have a complication from a surgery and you can't go back and talk to the, the actual person who conducted your surgery without getting on a plane, this could be problematic. Now, for, for the healthcare industry itself, by right, show of hands, how many of you are in the health? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I think you would, uh, but you still could have complications in the long term. For example, somebody who has heart surgery in, in the long term may have circulatory issues, for example. But it's a, it's a good point. You do have to stay there for, for follow-up. And technically, you probably stay in a hospital a little, a little longer than you would in the States based on how quickly they tend to push us out. So, but how many of you in here are majors uh, in something involving healthcare? Do, do, 
Lauren, does, does this, what's your, what's your medical opinion on this? Like, I know we just started talking about this today. What are your concerns? So we, we get the idea that we may, may be getting the best and brightest because of what we're paying in the United States compared to other countries. Uh, and I, I think you have a very valid point. Um, that being said, the results don't always bear that out because we're still following in the middle in, in results. I'm not saying our healthcare providers aren't awesome. My wife's a, a registered nurse, believe me. We have awesome providers here in the United States. I, I still think that the biggest thing we should be taking away from this, other than our own personal interests, is realizing that even our healthcare practitioners are now facing international competition. So we truly have a global economy and it applies to healthcare as well. Any other final points on this before we move on? Go once, go twice. Guys, we're gonna end our class today with a review. What you're about to see is pretty indicative of the kinds of questions you're gonna get on the exam. So we're gonna go through all three chapters Feel free to shout out the answers, and I'll be sending you a copy of this to get ready for our exam. When's our exam next week? You got it. All right, guys. Total amount, this is chapter one. Total amount of money a business takes in during a given period by selling goods and services is? It is revenue, correct. If a business is not is operating and not making money, what's it operating at? Ooh, try again. It's operating at a loss. Which of the following is not one of the five environments of business? We hope that there are moral people, but moral is not part of the five environments. All right. True or false? Over half of the executive workforce is male. Yeah, we're going. This is a decade of the female in this country. The five factors of production include all of the following except what? You guys got it, man. Well done. All right. Keep going. True or false? The U.S. is primarily an agricultural economy. Well, correct. All right. True or false? Based on our textbook, the U.S. has the highest standard of living in the world. Well, correct. People who are willing to gamble with large amounts of money have a high tolerance for what? And maybe B as well, but risk is the best answer. Buying and selling goods via the internet is called what? You got it. The study of how society employs resources to produce goods and services. If, if you give you for reading the whole thing, just give me an answer. It is macro. What did Thomas Malthus call economics? It is dismal. You got it. When self-directed gain leads to social and economic benefits for the whole community, it sounds like a horror movie. It is. The invisible hand is out to get us all. All or most of the land factories and stores are owned by people, not the government. What economic system am I talking about? Capitalism. Wonderful, delicious capitalism. True or false? China is a, an example of a country with state capitalism. True. True. By the way, what a, because it's got state capitalism and it's a communist system, what kind of economy would that be? It could be a mixed or it could also be called command economy. All right. Which of the following is not one of capitalism's four basic rights? Correct, Mundo. All right. In a free market, guys, true or false, a country's government determines how much of a product should be produced. Somebody say false because you're correct. What determines the price of items in a free market? B. Well, that's close. It is C, supply and demand. When supply and demand have crossed over, what do we have? Uh, C. It is B, market price. True or false? There's no such thing as perfect competition. Oh, uh, true. It is true. There's also no such thing as ghosts. Agree or disagree? Large number of sellers making similar products that the consumers see as different. What am I talking about? Oh, so close. Correct. All right. When economic system, what which economic system is most likely to provide the most benefits? Oh, it ain't communism. It is Bernie Sanders' idea. It is socialism. True or false? There are many incentives for workers and entrepreneurs to excel in a socialist economy. False. Correct, Mundo. When the best and brightest leave a socialist country, what do we call it? Ranger. 
It is brain drain. True or false, the U.S. spends more money in healthcare than any other country in the world. We do, unfortunately. An economic and political system in which the government makes almost all the economic decisions and owns everything. And what color is that associated with? You got it. They used to call it the Red Scare. And what kind of economies? The, the government largely determines what goods and services are produced, who gets them, and how the economy will grow. It is a command economy. You got it. Total value of final goods and services in a country in a given year. What is it? It is GDP me ASAP. True or false, guys, U.S. GDP is about five trillion. How much is it? It's it's over twenty. It's over twenty trillion. If somebody says I'm out of here, what kind of unemployment is that? Fictional, because they're chapping you. You know what? The unemployment rate, true or false, is an accurate measure of how many people are actually unemployed. False. What? You're correct. Why is that? Because some people just don't. You got it. The labor force participation rate. Well done. The general rise in prices and goods of services over time is what? You got it. It's not necessarily bad or good. CPI equals what? You got it. No prunes involved. The four phases of economic, of long-term business cycles include all but the following. Good, 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 good. You guys got this. Nice. If we have a recession that comes from a short-lived recovery followed by another recession. What do we got? Double dip. Nobody should double dip, whether it's chip dip or recessions. True or false, the federal government's efforts to keep the economy stable by increasing or decreasing taxes or government spending, that's monetary policy. Ooh, it is fiscal policy. I, I feel like Alex Trebek, oh, I'm sorry, you didn't use that in the form of a question. When government takes in more than it spends, those rare occasions, what do we have? We we got a surplus. Here's a bonus question for you guys. Under what president did we last have a government surplus? I did not spend all that money. It was Bill Clinton. I was going to say something else, but I can't do it on the microphone. The U.S. is the second largest importing and the third largest exporting nation in the world. Is that true or false? True. It is false. We're the number one importing nation. True or false? The U.S. is not one of the top ten countries in which to do business. It is true. We got to figure that out. We got to get more business. Generally speaking, in the, in the U.S., what percentage of our GDP comes from exports? Take a guess. It was in our tax. It is correct. Very well done. The largest holder of U.S. debt is which country? It is indeed China. True or false? If the total value of U.S. exports is less than U.S. imports, our country is operating at a trade surplus. False. It's a deficit. Selling products in a foreign country at lower prices than those charged in the producing country. What do we call that? It's a fun word. It is dumping, man. I love that. It's a great economic term. The lowest risk way of getting into foreign markets is what? C. No. D. D. It is D. It's licensing. Very good. Taco Bell in Tokyo is an example of what? C. It is a franchise. You got it. True or false? Transformers were a big hit in Japan before they came to the U.S. False. false. We had to make them cool here. True or false? A strategic alliance is more risky than a joint venture. False. That is false because a strategic alliance is, is limited term. The country making the most substantial investment in Africa is? You got it. They're buying up that oil quicker than you want to think about. True or false? When the dollar is trading for less, foreign goods are also less expensive. You guys are nailing this. Well done. Which of these countries has been criticized for devaluing their own currency? China seems to be a big answer for a lot of these questions. Tariffs. I'm sorry? It is, it is China. Tariffs can be a form of what? Trade protection. Very well done. What was the name of the car that had seats put in the back to avoid Brad. the chicken tax? Subaru Brat. What a beautiful car. The trade relationship between the U.S. and Cuba, we're almost done, it can best be described as what? Embargo. Embargo. All right. A regional group of countries with a common external tariff, no internal tariffs, and coordinated laws to exchange among members. What do we call that? It is a, a common market. You got it. Traveling outside your country to get treatment, what do we call that? Well done, guys. Have a wonderful day. I'll see you Friday.